Hi there. Really glad to see you again this week. And here's to you and a happy half hour. My name is Susie Schultz. I'm the executive director of the Museum of Broadcast Communication. And I am grabbing you my stolen NBC chimes, <laughs> which I have to return to the museum because we are open. The museum is open. It opened this past weekend and we are going to be open on Friday, Saturdays and Sundays. It's we are free through August 2nd. So please come and celebrate with us the fact that we are open again and you can see Stay Tuned, which is a wonderful exhibit from the radio from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame sent us this exhibit about the intersection of radio of television. I can get this right, I promise. Television and rock and roll. It has phenomenal artifacts. We go from Ed Sullivan all the way to MTV. We have great guitars, great memories, and great stories. So please come. Even if you are getting a free ticket, we need you to get online at museum.tv and make a reservation. And after that, you'll be able to come for a small fee. It's a small admission fee. Everybody is being um, kept safe. We are only allowing about 10 people in an hour. So we hope that you'll join us and come on back. Um, it's a great place to come. And also, you'll be able to visit the Radio Hall of Fame. The Radio Hall of Fame, which we are very excited to talk about today with the chairman of the Radio Hall of Fame, Craig Kitchen. Craig, you are here. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to hear it. And that stay tuned. If I knew that I could wait until now and see it just one of 10 people, I would feel like I'm on a private tour at the museum. It, the, the number of items from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that we have at the museum, uh, it's really a, a special collection of items. I mean, you really get transformed immediately back into the sense of some of those performances that were on the Ed Sullivan show to the modern day activities and all the conversation that musicians from Jimi Hendrix to Barbara Streisand and everybody in between has uh, has just helped to create. It's, it is very worthwhile to see that conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you for that endorsement. And I do know too, as we know, it really, really shows how the broadcast industry, whether it's radio or television or digital, has really changed so many different industries. I mean, here was television in the 1940s who really didn't want to deal with uh, rock and roll music or the counterculture. They wanted to be in your home and safe. And then in the 1950s, they looked around and said, wait a minute, we need these kids. And so they yes. elevated rock and roll and rock and roll elevated television. So it's just, I, I love when we are able to bring to people, and you know this, um, uh, as we've talked about this, when we're able to bring to people a sense of how the broadcast industry really changes the discourse and changes society. So. I mean, I, just as I just think about and revisit everything that I saw in the state, stay tuned exactly. You know, the, from the simplest things like, you know, uh, Dick Clark's input into the process to the American Bandstand to the, you know, the, just all of the performances. You, you're right. At some point in time, the television industry made a concerted effort to figure out a way to just capture the electricity and the enthusiasm of musicians and just make it a real part of television programming. And it's there at the Museum of Broadcast Communication. It's, uh, it's worth a visit, particularly when there can be a private tour of about 10 people or less at a time. Wow. That's And then you can go good. through the Radio Hall of Fame. And you can oh, yeah. we have we have not just the Radio Hall of Fame. We do have a little taste of Chicago television. We have Bozo, we have Oprah, we have uh, um, uh, Sven Gulli, but as you round the corner from the Stay Tuned, you'll be able to walk through the Radio Hall of Fame and it is a project um and a uh, of, that the museum is so proud to be able to um, be part of and to 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 shepherd. And we have more than uh, um, 280 people in that Radio Hall of Fame, don't we, Craig? We do, yeah. The, and by the way, the radio industry is so appreciative and always has been that the Museum of Broadcast Communication was created in a way that could include the radio industry and the Radio Hall of Fame. The number of people who are in our industry who are very prideful that there is an actual physical place, some place in the United States that recognizes some of the greatest talents in our industry uh, and showcases their talents in a way that we do at the Radio Hall of Fame. They're um, wonderful to have. And I'm glad it's there and I'm glad you're proud of it. And I'm glad so many people 
when there are all of the other exhibits. Well, we, I, I love that, um, you know, in the history of broadcast, right, when, uh, when television came along and the whole radio world basically said this is over and people said radio is over, how wrong that yeah. was. Um, um, because radio has continued to be key in our discourse, right? Whether it is a political discourse, whether it's musical discourse, radio is still so much a part of our lives. And we are, we're in the 100th anniversary. Yeah. Right? I about yeah. <laughs> You're right. 100 years this November 2020. Uh, you know, the first radio station that emitted sounds for an audience to listen to in Pittsburgh, KDKA, um, covering election night coverage 100 years ago. And now fast forward today when, you know, there are, you know, some 12,000 radio stations that are um, uh, sharing conversation or music one way or another uh, and, and very advanced. And for all of the mediums that have come along, whether or not it is broadcast television or cable television or a pay-per-view or over-the-top television now or um, the audio streaming channels and um, satellite radio advent, uh, the, the fact that broadcast radio today continues to be as pervasive and inclusive and um, part of the soundtrack of people's lives every day. We're very fortunate and also very fortunate that the invention of the automobile came along and gave it uh, center stage on that dashboard. There's no question about that. That helped a big deal. <laughs> it is great. It is great. So um, um, it is for radio. I just thought maybe we could talk a little bit about you and your background as well. I want people to know um, how lucky we are to have somebody like you on our board. Um, yeah. But you have been, you've been in the radio industry for a, a little bit yourself, haven't you? Not 100 years, but yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been in the radio industry just a little longer than the Radio Hall of Fame has and the Museum of Broadcast Communication, just longer than three decades. I'm a radio program producer and a syndicator, and that means that in my line of work, I find and work with talented individuals who are on-air personalities, they're disc jockeys, they're talk radio hosts, and they have an interest in being syndicated, being heard in more than one city where they live in. And in the process, I help them find staff members and studios, sales staffs to help monetize their radio program, affiliate relations people to help us find radio stations for them to be heard on. And together we create a business around that so that they can have a large sustained audience for a period of time and just make great radio. That's the business that I'm in and uh, it's helped me with the Radio Hall of Fame and, and the Museum of Broadcast Communication uh, attract all kinds of um, great individuals and great interest in their industry. Well, it certainly also has built for you a, um, a stable of people who uh, are grateful for everything that you brought them in their careers. Uh, I was just wondering what you, as a, um, a radio executive, think about where radio is right now. I mean, it's a rough time for everyone um, in the midst of a pandemic and uh, um, a lot of chaos. But where do you think radio is um, uh, as an industry? Sure. It's a strong industry right now. I'm prideful of the fact that this November is its 100th year of existence. Uh, 100 years ago in November, KDKA AM, the first radio station to uh, draw an audience's attention uh, by offering election night returns. Um, uh, the industry has uh, modernized to a place that it is available not only um, through car radios and in-home radios, but also now on the Alexa devices and the, the Google Home devices. Uh, virtually everybody's phone is the new transistor radio. Um, and through audio streaming and satellite distribution, as well as really superior sounding AM and FM radio stations, the content and the audience connection is very vibrant. Uh, I think on average, 95% of all Americans listen to radio at one point in time each week. Uh, our average listener spends about two and a half hours of the day listening to a radio station seven days a week. Um, so there's a, a high level of engagement today. And with all the other mediums that are offering their video programs on demand and new cable networks showing up every day, I'm happy to see the radio industry thrive and continue to have a great connection. Well, you know, it's always been, uh, um, it's always been your friend. It's always been whatever you wanted to listen to. I can remember um, uh, with my ridiculous little ball uh, radio that 
I carried with me my transistor, uh, um, being able to listen under the covers to baseball games, being able to listen, you know, past bedtime to all of my favorite radio stars here in Chicago, um, WLS. Sure. Um, it was it was it kept me company and um, and it keeps me company in the car and it keeps me company. I will say I turn to radio even today to hear other people talk, to hear those voices. I miss that interaction in quarantine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, 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 you can work with it on, right? <laughs> so Very it, good it, chip it, medium. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this and thrilled to be part of uh, um, actually bringing people um, the, the, not only the ability to celebrate radio, but to celebrate the individuals that have really struck a chord in their heart. And I know in the radio hall of fame, which is, it's just really, um, it is so very cool that I have to walk through the radio hall of fame at least five to six times a day. And, um, I'm oh, just through the radio good for you. And I learn something each time I'm in there from Orson Welles to Wendy Williams, from Tom Joyner to Studs Terkel. And then we have the programs that are in there, Burns and Allen and Mike and Mike. And Mike and Mike are actually were one of my favorite. I mourned when they broke up. Um, <laughs> Fibber McGee and Molly <laughs> and, Eric and Kathy Go and All Things Considered. Um, and there, and there's just, it's a, it's a wonderful swatch of seeing not just the radios because we have the radios in there, but the personalities that have brought them to life. Um, and yeah. it's great to be able to keep adding to it. Uh, and, and so this year we have what, what, now tell us a little bit about the format. How, how do we elect people in the radio? How do we induct people, get those nominees and those inductions? Sure. A group of industry individuals, uh, some 25 that assemble each year to choose nominations for induction to the Radio Hall of they suggestion you and slide get together ask of thousands of suggestions narrowing it to twenty four nominees sixteen of those twenty four nominees are voted upon by a voting panel of radio industry um, individuals people who are in the line of business all of it. Um, they're invited through a confidential ballot to share their four selections from the 16 choices that are put in front of them. The radio industry then opens itself up to the listener vote. And listeners are encouraged each year to vote on four personalities and spoken word, talk radio, for instance, or sports radio, where your program Mike and Mike came from, as well as from music radio as well. And the radio industry welcomes listener votes on those eight nominated individuals and over a two week period of time uh, receive hundreds of thousands of uh, votes of which one individual is selected for induction. And that counts as one vote when the committee of 25 individuals reconvenes and makes their final decisions on those last two inductions. And so this week and next week through Sunday, August 9th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific, we welcome people to go to a website. And the website is www.radiovote.com. And you can find it one of two ways, either through the Radio Hall of Fame website or directly at that website that's up for just two weeks of the year, radiovote.com. Listeners are allowed to vote once for their favorite personality in music and once for their favorite personality in the world of talk or spoken word. And that's how we include the industry and make a really tough set of uh, decisions in terms of who does get inducted to join the names of individuals that you've spoken about, from Paul Harvey to Fibber McGee, from Wendy Williams to Tom Joyner to Casey Kasem to Ryan Seacrest. It's a tough thing to do, Susie. When you think about the fact that the radio industry has been in existence for a hundred years this year, there has been a connection between these and talk personalities for that long, but we've only been in business for 32 years as a radio hall of fame. And each year we induct on average eight individuals. So if you do the math, we're just greater than 250 inductees and trailing far behind in the number of years that we've taken into consideration to recognize all of the worthy individuals. Um, that's probably the Radio Hall of Fame's largest challenge, 
is to properly recognize the right individuals each year, the most deserving of them in any number of ways. And so if anybody wants to take a look um, uh, um, uh, at, at who all has been inducted in the past, they can also go to the Radio Hall of Fame website. If you Google Ra the Radio Hall of Fame, you can look at all of those names to see who already has been in there. So you can prepare yourself for next year when you want to nominate somebody. But if you want to vote, and we're going to um, we're going to go to that uh, specific website you were talking about, we've got two categories for the public to vote on, right? Um, and it starts. Right. Um, it, it opened up yesterday, so you can go right after this radio program and vote. Um, and in the music format, an on-air personality, I think we have um, we have what one, two, three, four people in there. And uh, um, Whitney Allen is the first one, correct? Right, Whitney Allen, a great country music air personality who uh, found her way to country music after starting out on rock radio. Um, she's a Southern California native who has. Uh, migrated to uh, being one of the predominant country music personalities heard nationwide. Uh, Whitney's voice uh, is just synonymous with uh, great companionship with hit country music and conversations and just witnessing a wonderful rapport she has with country music audiences. Oh, that is great. So that is great. Uh, Whitney yeah. Allen is the first, yeah. She's the first, and then we go to Bob and Sherry, and I love this picture. Right. Um. <laughs> Their picture emblemizes the kind of fun that you will discover when you happen upon one of their 100 plus affiliations. Uh, Bob is almost a comedian by nature. Sherry is absolutely wakes up laughing and funny. And uh, the two of them together have a chemistry that you just hear from time to time when you discover somebody at a cocktail party or a meeting or an outdoor barbecue or someplace where you're just magnetically attracted to wanting to be with those people because they're having so much fun. That is the Bob and Sherry. You can see it right there in picture form beautifully. They, are, they just are, I, I have to say, I've not heard them and um, <laughs> looking at the picture, all I want to do is listen to them. They look like the, the people who are the fun ones at the party. Um, so, and then we have Sway yeah. Holloway. Oh, Sway. Now, Sway Calloway is an industry based a music artist. This is a rapper, a Oakland Bay area of San Francisco, who was successful as a music artist just to begin with, before being attracted to one of the top uh, urban hip hop radio stations in our industry, KMEL. And there he didn't start at late nights or overnights or on the weekends, but he started in morning drive there, and he was incredibly successful and syndicated in two or three dozen cities with a longevity that included, you know, great success in New York City, as well as San Francisco and a whole lot of markets in between. Sirius XM found him and made him a part of the Eminem Channel 45 uh, facility. Uh, but he not only is a great orator of, um, of music and a great tastemaker for music and really has great credibility with other music artists, also is a, a tremendous interviewer. I listened to a series that he created from, of all places, San Quentin, California, interviewing uh, inmates who are desiring to improve their lives by learning how to write computer code and, and find their way to successful careers. You, you wouldn't expect it from a music personality, but you would certainly expect it from somebody like Sway, who's just got great insight, a great curiosity, and great people skills. Oh, that is, and so in rounding out that category are John Boy and Billy. Great yeah, combo. Oh, wow. Great, name. great combo. Like Bob and Sherry, John Boy and Billy call Charlotte, North Carolina their home. And they are the one of the first, starting in 1992, to sit their laughter and their comedy and their relationships from North Carolina nationwide. Um, not just because of their great connections to the NASCAR industry um, or that great element of classic rock music that they play as a part of their morning, but the two of them just have a friendship and a that you, you can listen to in the car or listen to at home and just pretend and really feel like you're one of the group, one of the guys one of this, the team members, and, and not just for men, but men and women, and they just have a, just a great nature. Yeah, that is, and you know, the trouble is that those are four phenomenal groups and individuals, it's actually what, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six individuals, <laughs> but um, yeah. those are 
really, 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 really hard to choose from. Um, you yeah. know, and, and we all have our own affinity for different things, but it's really, it speaks very much to the problem that you put before us for the Radio Hall of Fame is that there's a lot out of there. There's a lot of phenomenal people and um, choosing them. We're grateful that the audience is going to help us choose some of these people. So um, yeah, in the spoken word category on on-air personality, we also have, a, we have another set of uh, um, incredible shows and people, right? Right. Glenn Beck being one of them. Uh, Glenn is the first of the four nominees that we'll probably talk about in this category. Starlin has done some amazing things in the time that he has been on the air as a storyteller, as somebody who is open and emotional communication and uh, a glimpse into his personal life basis, a passion. Uh, it's one part of it, an individual about the love country. Um, he has done some amazing things with his radio audience from half a million people on the, the mall in Washington, D.C. one year to celebrate America, uh, to any number of ways that he has just made his audience feel very inclusive and included in his life. He's the first of the four nominees in the category. And we have we several have... others as well. Who else do you have? We have John and Ken from the eponymous John and Ken show. <laughs> yeah, and that is true. Fantastic. Yeah, they have been on a radio station in Los Angeles by AM 640 for 25 years and six o'clock in the afternoon. Anomaly talented, very conversant, very politically active, very motivating to encourage audience to vote and use their voice for an outcome in California elections, not just in Southern California, but, but, but overall. Very successful in New Jersey as well on Jersey 101, one of the great FM talk stations like KFI is before that. But they're ranking as a number one afternoon drive host year in and year out. The two of them together have earned them. The and they are also rallying their fans, aren't they? <laughs> they were early and very active in getting their fans to know that the Radio Hall of Fame needs to hear from them. Absolutely. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And we have also in that category, Stephanie Miller. Stephanie also from Southern California, nationwide, one of the premier voices that a liberal point of view on radio, which uh, for all of the talk about the radio, industry and then the end of it's on NPR or it's on a radio station conservative voices they have been known to have incredible rate a standalone personality talent to the program every day as well as uh, just really heartening to, to listen to if you agree with her points of view you're going to think that she's the smartest woman in the world if you don't agree with her point of view, you're going to be maddened at some of the things that she might do. You are going to learn so much about an opposing point of view, which is really one of the magics of the radio medium is to actually look and have a better understanding of what the world is thinking. It's, it's so uh, very deserving of this nomination. You can, you can tune in to anyone who doesn't believe as you believe and get a chance to really understand and, and, and acclimate yourself to different points of view. So I found ra radio a great equalizer and a great, um, uh, you know, sometimes, you, of course, you, you have to turn off because you're infuriated. But um, uh, we have one final category, and they come, from the, they come from the hometown of the Museum of Broadcast Communication in Chicago. And they they do. The program Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the phenomenal program from National Public Radio and right there from Chicago, from WBEZ, one of the few radio programs that has found a way to have a live studio audience in a theater weekend and week out. I mean, this is one of the few that I've seen in Chicago to be tickets to see them that happen in that radio program in a live stage environment. You've seen it, haven't you? I have seen it. I love it. Um, it is just fun. And what's very nice is they have managed as well 
to transfer that, you know, from the Chase Auditorium live show to um, to be able to still keep producing their show in this quarantine time. And it's and they and the magic still happens. They're really they do a great job of um, uh, of making you feel like everybody's having a good time. And, you know, everybody wants to be at a party, um, especially these right. days. Brilliant. When Just you're right. You're and it's so brilliantly produced to make you feel like you absolutely are very welcome in that. I, you actually get smarter for free listening to wait, wait, don't tell me. Uh, and, you know, we've we've been very fortunate. Carl Castle, one of the early voices who um, served on that program for many, many years, um, finally as a judge uh, and uh, somebody who was the official last word in the, uh, the trivia contest that goes on between listeners is already a member of the Radio Hall of Fame. Uh, Peter Segal is the list, the you know the host now that we hear uh, a voice of, but there are so many voices that come together. I, I'm just enthused and put into a good mood every time I hear that program. It is, it is, it is, it is. And if we're if we're rooting for the hometown Chicagoans, okay. So I'm just saying you can vote for them. But um, uh, um, I um, I I have one vote just like anybody else, and uh, um, uh, um, and audience members, we want you to come vote. We want you to um, visit. We want you to vote once. It's not, you know, it's not a Chicago election. Um, it's not early <laughs> enough. <laughs> vote once. And and Craig, tell us, um, um, we are not going to be able to. I was lucky enough to go to my very first Radio Hall of Fame party last uh, um, last fall, and it was magnificent. You threw a phenomenal party in New York. Um, this year, we were planning on having it in Chicago. But what ha what are we going to do instead? The induction ceremonies, when these decisions are made and we choose eight inductees, it will be heard on radio, appropriately enough. Um, we're going to respect social distancing. We're going to respect everybody's privacy and, and right to safety and uh, good health. And instead of having an induction ceremony that has traditionally been a black tie event in Chicago, uh, a couple of years, we've had it in New York to expand uh, the reach of uh, our induction ceremonies. But this year, it's going to be on radio for all to hear. We're going to do it on Thursday evening, October 29th. Tradition has it, one of our inductees will be asked to be the, uh, the moderator or the host for the evening. One of our fellow inductees, Jim Bohannon of Westwood One, will be the announcer. And it will be our pleasure to recognize and induct eight very worthy individuals, some of who we talked about here today. Uh, into the Radio Hall of Fame with that induction ceremony. Of course, we'll stream it through the Museum of Broadcast Communications website, through the Radio Hall of Fame's website, which is a part of the museum, and on as many applications as we can find, whether or not it is through iHeartRadio or Radio.com, or we can convince our friends at SiriusXM to also allow us to have clearance. But we'll put it on hundreds of radio stations as well so that everybody can hear this, Susie including one, hopefully, on a great affiliate like WLS in Chicago, something that you've listened to for a long time. That would be really wonderful. Let's plant that seed. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we're that. looking forward to that. And now we voting closes for the public. So it's not a, it doesn't go on in perpetuity. It only goes on for two weeks, right? Right, through Sunday, August 9th. And so you're right. Uh, find your way to radiovote.com. Take advantage of it mm -hmm. while you're thinking about it and you're online right now. It uh, doesn't mm -hmm. cost anything to vote. And uh, your voting process can take as much as, you know, uh, a minute or two. But we would love to hear your voices in terms of these eight inductees and all of the information about these eight nominees, I'm sorry, are available at radiovote.com. This is wonderful. This is great. We are so excited. Craig, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this week and um, tell everybody about what's going on and also giving us a chance to really just get a wash in radio. It's history. It's dynamic. And what a powerful medium it is. So we're so grateful to you and uh, anybody who wants to join us next week. Um, uh, I, we will be, I'll be talking to George Offman, another radio man, um, from a sports radio raconteur, if you will call him that. And he's been on, uh, WBBM now for a number of years. And so we were talking to him about his career. And this Friday, if you join us on Instagram at 530, my colleagues from the museum, Aileen and Olivia are going to be talking about reality TV as they do every month. 
So we're really looking forward to seeing you again online and stopping here. We're going to have some, we have some in August. We are having some programs, some teaching programs coming up. So I want you to take a look for those as well. And our thanks again to Craig and to the whole Radio Hall of Fame group. They have been so helpful in putting this on. And we are so grateful to have them as part of the Museum of Broadcast Communications family. We'll see you next week. <laughs>